Good morning. It's a privilege and honor to stand before this congregation, these friends of Hyde Park, and present a word to you that's given to me by God. I want to honor your pastor, Pastor Charlene Hill, who many of you may not know, our paths have crossed, not only within our denomination of the United Church of Christ, but at Chicago Theological Seminary. Uh, where we were in an organization together my first year there. I also want to thank you for uh, our liturgist today, Mr. Nietzsche Brooker Celeste, the soloist, violinist, Edith Yokely, which I think we might know your family, um, as well as uh, Sound Media. We serve on the Illinois Conference Council together for our annual celebration. Um, and then your director of music, Joe Wilkinson. And last but not least, one of the most hospitable people I could have met this side of Zion, and that is Mrs. Val Scott. She's extremely gracious, and I thank you for her coordination and efforts um, as I serve this church on today. You have heard the reading of God's word today, and I just want to lift up the verses, verses 8 and 9 of Genesis chapter 3. Let us pray. Eternal and loving God in whom we live, move, and have our being, we are grateful and thankful for your mercy and your grace, for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. We honor you today for your abundance and want to be a part of your abundance, O oh God, that we may do good in this world, not only with our hands, but with our hearts, that we may serve you and that whatever we do on this day, you be glorified so that the body of Christ may continue to grow and strengthen itself in a world that doesn't always seem like you are near. Even when we can't trace you, we trust you. And we lift up this word that it may be pleasing to you so that we may ever know that you are God and we are your people. This is the prayer that we pray in Jesus' matchless and wonderful name. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Genesis 3 verses 8 and 9 says for our hearing, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Where are you? And so this morning I tagged this text from the very words of God's mouth, where are you? are you. My wife, who I don't want to fail to introduce to you, will you please stand, Mrs. Catherine Underwood. My wife and I, when we moved to South Holland, anytime someone would visit, we would give them landmarks as part of the directions to our house. More often than not, people would get lost the first time because our block has the same street number as the next block over. So people would usually turn on place rather than street. It never failed that the phone would ring and on the other end we hear something like, I'm in front of your house. Looking through the window, we see no one. So one of us would ask, where are you? Sometimes people would call and say, I can't find your house. Again, I would ask, where are you? Other times, the caller would say that they turned onto the block, but then turned down a side street that was just one house before ours. If by the third time I'd ask, the response would usually slip into something like, where you at? Where are you can be a simple but complex question whether to give directions from here to there or there to here, or to jolt someone out of deep thought, bringing a wandering mind back into focus, or to ascertain where someone stands on a position politically or philosophically. Where are you might be the aha moment that either confirms suspicion about a situation or a person or affirms through reflection that you were intrinsically right about something without someone else's validation. The only place in the Bible where are you appears is in Genesis 3, verse 9. And I believe the question is rooted in suspicion, reflection, and hope. 
So what is the backstory to this question? The pretext in Genesis verse 8 and 9 is very familiar to us. Adam and Eve are living in the Garden of Eden. They have everything they need. There are no worries. More importantly, the management of God's economy is placed in Adam's hands. God instructed Adam to tend to the garden and that he may eat from any of the trees except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from that tree, you will certainly die. If you read the creation story closely, you will discover that out of the ground, God grew all kinds of trees that were good for food. Yet in the middle of the garden, the text mentions that there are two particular trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God informs Adam that he can eat from any of these trees except that tree of the garden of good and evil. However, God doesn't say why. And in this stage of creation, cognitively, there is no reason why Adam would ask why not. We also learn that God, is, God said it's not good that man should be by himself. So out of man, God creates woman. God joins them together as man and wife. They are naked but not ashamed. Cognitively, they would not have known the difference, yet it's important for us to know. As we turn the page to chapter 3, there seems to be a gap in the story. A new character is introduced, and the tree of the, lot, of the knowledge of good and evil takes center stage. There is no mention of the tree of life until the end of the chapter. And it is important that Adam and Eve no longer have access to the tree of life. And so now we are immediately drawn into a conflict. Imagine, if you can, that you are Adam or Eve. God has placed you in the middle of paradise, in the Garden of Eden, to care for this revolutionary ecosystem. Revolutionary because of all the things God created, trees were essential. How you care for the ecosystem becomes provision in return. Trees were Adam and Eve's source of food, protection, shelter, and wellness in the same way they are for many of the wild species God created. So why would God disrupt the ecosystem with a serpent and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? There are multiple theological and philo philosophical reflections that come from introducing a ser serpent and a forbidden tree. And I can guarantee you there is no single answer. Rather, we are left to reflect on the question God raises before Adam and Eve. Where are you? Where are you now that we have come, that you have come to the knowledge and change? Where are you as you go from innocence to experience? Where are you when you exercise your free will and moral agency? Where are you in times of testing and testimony? Where are you when you are faced with obedience and sacrifice? Where are you when it comes to accountability and care? Suspicion finds its way into the garden. To Adam and Eve, I imagine the serpent did not appear suspicious. It was Adam who named the animals, including the wild ones. So if God gave Adam the responsibility to name the animals, then it is possible that Adam introduced Eve to all the animals he named. The serpent was part of the wildlife for Adam to manage. Yet, an ominous, as ominous as the serpent is, let us consider its role as it speaks to the nature of temptation to suspend the imaginative nature of representing evil today. And here is why. The serpent's behavior is cunning. It eases up to Eve and says, did God really say you must not eat of any tree in the garden? Eve responds, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. The difficulty of Eve's response is the inaccuracy of her answer. There are two trees in the middle of the garden, and if you go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, 
Eve refers neither to the tree of life nor to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She says not to eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. So my question is, which tree? Does she know the difference or is she playing naive to the serpent? Nevertheless, the serpent is not done. The serpent says, Eve, you will not die. God knows that the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will know and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Here is the cunning and temptation of the serpent. What the serpent did was to remove suspicion from himself by introducing curiosity into the story. Now, curiosity is a wonderful thing. We teach our children to be curious because it opens their minds to exploration and learning. Curious children ask questions. It is said that the more questions they ask, the more curious they become. And if you've ever talked to a three-year-old, one question can lead to multiple questions of why? Why? Next question, then why? Eve's curiosity created a desire to know if what the serpent said was true. Even though textually we read that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the one to leave alone, it doesn't dismiss the fact that there are two trees in the middle of the garden. We should consider that the tree became more attractive because curiosity caused Eve to reflect on her experience in the garden against what she has been told by the serpent. You won't die, but you will be like God. How enticing is that? Let me say it another way. Sometimes we want what we can't have which makes us want it even more. Every one of us has some Eve in us. We become curious about the things we don't know. We begin to reflect on what ought to be versus what is. Curiosity lets us investigate the, and test things out. It is the mother of invention. Yet it comes with risk and sometimes peril. For some, curiosity turns into gossip when trying to validate what you think you've heard or you think you know. Eve took a risk. Her curiosity led her to trust the serpent instead of questioning it. She did not consider what might come from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve went along with the plan instead of following God's plan. Eve didn't ask why. Think about how many times you made the wrong decision because you failed to question. You believe what someone told you with only one side of the story. How many times did you go into a voting booth and voted for the wrong leader because you failed to question their record? How many times have you taken advice from someone who doesn't want to pour into you because you failed to answer the question? How many times have you dated or married the wrong man or woman because you were so in love that you failed to ask about their character? How many times have you been scammed on the phone by a telemarketer because you failed to question? You eat from the wrong tree when you fail to follow God's plan. Eve saw that the fruit of the tree looked good and was pleasing to her eyes. So she took some of the fruit and gave some to Adam, and they ate together. And according to the Bible, Adam was right there with her, nearby, in the garden, in proximity to what was going on. And because of curiosity, their disobedience led to a broken relationship with God and charged a course for redemption for sin. Eve missed an opportunity to question and Adam missed an opportunity to protect. Their physical death was not imminent, but the death of their innocence was immediate. Their eyes were open. They became aware of some things they were not afraid of before. They realized that they were naked and tried to cover up their mess by hiding among the trees in the garden. The ecosystem that they cared for, that nourished them and provided provision to them, they were exiled from. But I believe God gave them a chance to repair the relationship. God came looking and said to Adam, where are you? 
The question is first asked of Adam, not Eve. Because the core of the problem didn't start with a branch. It began with the root. Where are you? Where are you when God comes looking for you? Are you hiding among the trees? Hiding your blessings? Hiding behind your title? Or hiding behind your arrogance? Too often the blame is assigned to Eve because that is what patriarchy does. Where are you? It's not asked of them, but it is asked of Adam. You'll find it in verse 9. Where are you is that psychological question of what happens when you point a finger at someone and three fingers are pointing back at you. Where are you becomes a question of the human condition. Where are you? Where are you? And there are at least three lessons we can learn from the question. The first lesson is, look for God. In this text, we are talking about how we should look for God. Adam was not lost in the garden. God knew exactly where Adam was and what had been done. But too often when we get in trouble, we shift and place the blame elsewhere. Some of you blame your spouse or your significant other for everything that's going wrong in your life. And Adam says to God, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit of the tree and I ate it. He shifted the blame. Rather than taking responsibility for the situation, Adam points his finger at Eve. He did this of his own free will. He didn't try to stop Eve. He didn't remove the serpent from the garden. He chose to take the fruit and eat it. He chose to disobey God. When his eyes were open, rather than looking to God and for God and God's invitation to confession, he took his woman and tried to hide. He had one assignment to tend to the garden and not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam took his help meat, a bone of his bone, the flesh of his flesh, and turned her into his accomplice. Stop making those who ride with you die for you. He or, she, he or she might be loyal to you, but don't make them die for you. Tend to the responsibility given to you and care for the things God has placed in your hands. This doesn't mean life won't get hard. This doesn't mean you won't have disagreements, but don't disrespect those you are in relationship with to save yourself. Once Adam and Eve became aware of their nakedness, they found themselves at a crossroads. They had an important decision to make. Do we go before our father and tell him what we did? Or do we hide and hope he doesn't find out? Their dilemma presents them with a choice. They were at the, were the crossroads, but Adam missed the opportunity to look for God. We must look for God. We must look for God when we are feeling like we are drowning or sinking. We must look for God when you feel like you're all alone. We must look for God when you don't know how to make ends meet. When tomorrow doesn't seem possible because you have tears in your eyes today, we must look for God. We must look for God when normal becomes uncomfortable and your uncomfortable becomes painful. You must look for God when problems in your life prevail and your situation doesn't match your circumstance. Whatever the situation may be, look for God. Don't have God looking for you. God can handle the mistakes we make. There's no need to hide from God but we should lift up our eyes to the hills from which comes our help. We should pray without ceasing. We should knock on God's door. And in a time of trouble, we should always look for God. And then the second lesson I believe this text presents to us that we can learn from Adam and Eve is to reflect, don't deflect. Reflect, don't deflect. When God asks Adam, where are you? His answer might have been different had he taken the time to reflect on his mistake. Where are you pushes you to examine and contemplate, analyze your thoughts, feelings, and actions. Now, admittedly, 
Adam confessed that he was afraid and hid because he was physically naked. And we don't know what he was feeling, especially since he was coming to the awareness or knowledge that his physical appearance had changed. But look at what God does. God says to him, who told you that you were naked? This moment of who told you, I believe, was an opportunity of reflection. God gives Adam a second chance to reflect and be honest about the situation he now finds himself in. This is who God is and this is what God does. God is a God of second chances, a chance to admit to our wrongdoings, a chance to admit that we've made a mistake. However, Adam took the path of least resistance and says, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Adam did not take the second chance. He deflected by pointing his finger at Eve for God. He took the opportunity to not admit his wrongdoing and pointed his finger at Eve. Deflection is a defense mechanism. When a person is trying to pass something on to someone else, they deflect. When they try to draw attention away from themselves, they deflect. To, their goal is to avoid the negative consequences of their actions. Deflecting, however, can have damaging consequences for a relationship. It can make working with people difficult. And I'm sure we've all worked with someone in our lives who deflected and made it for difficult relationships. I'm sure that you, what you need to know is to avoid people who try to make themselves look good all while making you look bad. And so the fastest way to destroy a relationship is to deflect your mistakes onto someone else. When Adam deflected, immediately it triggered a chain reaction. Adam drew away the attention away from him by blaming Eve. So God turned to Eve to ask, what is this that you have done? And I can imagine Eve was stunned by the accusation. I can see her eyes getting wide and her, eye, and her mind thinking, I can't trust the one and only man given to me in this garden. Her awareness of the situation now puts her in the hot seat with God. So when God asks Eve, what is this you have done? She turns the attention from herself saying, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Eve now deflects. We have more finger pointing blame and lack of accountability. Neither Adam or Eve took the time to collaborate or get on the same page with this story. They failed to problem solve. They were not open to transparency. And she did, use the she did not use the opportunity herself to receive a second chance. Had they not eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would not have become aware of their situation. Now their physical and psychological nakedness has become a moral issue. They feel shame. Emotions they had not experienced before are now present. And the message God is bringing to our attention is that we must guard our psychological nakedness because when we don't think with the mind of God, we open ourselves to temptation and cunning. And this shapes our awareness. We see it every day. 34 counts and can still run for president. And for my younger folks, did he do it or did he not? Talking about Sean Puffy Combs. So where are you? What, who told you that you were naked? Are you ready to answer those questions? Where are you and who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you should be ashamed of the color of your skin? Who told you that blonde hair and blue contacts are standards of beauty? Who told you that you are pretty for a dark-skinned girl? Who told you that your skin makes you look exotic? Who told you that black people don't want to work and are lazy when there are no jobs in the community? Who told you that God doesn't call women to preach? Who told you that you couldn't be anything you wanted to be? Don't let anyone make you feel naked and ashamed. 
Your life is in God's hands. So reflect on how good God has been to you. Reflect on how faithful God has been. Reflect on how God has kept you and never left you. Reflect on God's mercy and grace. Reflect, don't deflect. Because reflection is life-giving. It is affirming. Reflection allows you to have compassion for yourselves and others. To have a deeper relationship with God, even when you make a mistake, gives you time to reflect and to look for God. Look for God. Reflect, don't deflect. And then finally, consider the source. Consider the source. Adam and Eve's story reads as a cautionary tale. Sin entered the world because of their disobedience and they were banished from the Garden of Eden. Essentially, the tree of life is lost to them. God guarded the tree of life. But I am still curious of there being two trees. Then I considered that throughout Genesis, there are these pairings and dualities that exist that makes us ask these questions. There are pairings, there are pairings like heaven and earth, light and darkness, evening and morning, animals of each kind and male and female. Even with two trees in the middle of the garden, the tree that got Adam and Eve caught up was a pairing with the tree of life. So why was the tree of life guarded and not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Adam and Eve are banished from the garden and we might presume that the tree of life of the garden of good and evil, I'm sorry, the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil is no longer in temptation. They were banished from Eden. There were no more humans in the garden. So why does God protect the tree of life. Here's where I want to push us. Since Adam and Eve's disobedience, I believe God set out on a journey to find a source that would bring redemption to creation. Adam and Eve failed to be that source. So we begin to see a character trait of God that we might not associate with God. And the character trait is vulnerability. Vulnerability refers to a state of being exposed to the possibility of being harmed, either physically, emotionally, or mentally. So therefore, don't throw rocks at me, because I know if I push it, we often don't want to consider that God is a God of vulnerability as well. I know vulnerability is not an attribute we would use for God. We know God is holy. God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. God is all-knowing and powerful. Everything God is, we are not. God is perfect. So how can God be vulnerable? What proof do you have, Reverend Troy? Well, I'm glad you asked. And I want to keep pushing this narrative about God being vulnerable. You may, need, you may not need a vulnerable God, but I need one who loves me enough to have mercy and grace when I don't deserve it. I need a vulnerable God when I've been harmed, either physically, emotionally, or mentally. I need a vulnerable God when I am socially vulnerable, being discriminated against, exploited, uh, or exploited economically. Rather than walk alone, God created man so that man would not be alone. God created woman for that reason. When God created man and woman in his image and likeness, I believe God was being vulnerable. God gave them his character. He was being vulnerable. God was self-giving. He was being vulnerable. But they could not be perfect as God is perfect. But God didn't give up here. God sought redemption using his vulnerability to establish new covenants on earth. God considered several sources because humanity needed a second chance. God made a covenant, if you recall, with Noah sending a flood to renew creation and reaffirm the image of God with humanity, but that failed. God made a covenant with Abraham, establishing that the blessings of God would extend to all of Abraham's descendants, but the nations divided, and that failed. God made a covenant with Moses, freeing those in bondage with still a promise of land, blessings, and freedom, but that failed. 
God made a covenant with David to secure the promises of his descendants of Abraham, and yet that failed. But God did not stop there. In God's vulnerability, there was still a source to tap into. And this is why the tree of life has a source that the others did not have. And in my prophetic imagination, and to get back on top of the world, God went back to Eden. God walked to the middle of the garden. God told the cherubim to step aside. God stopped the flaming sword from revolving in front of the tree. Then God stood before the tree. God reached deep inside and pulled from God's self a source that the world had never seen before. And so that, so that the world would know who he is, God found a young girl by the name of Mary. She was a virgin from a small town called Nazareth. God went into Mary's body and a seed was planted and she conceived. But the people questioned and said, can anything good come from Nazareth? So that Mary should not be alone with the child, God said, let me give this baby an earthly father. So Mary married a brother named Joseph. Joseph was a carpenter by trade, so he had to know a little something about trees. And the Bible says, when Mary gave birth, the angels rejoiced. They called him Emmanuel, God is with us, but his parents named him Jesus. Jesus, as we know, is a pretty little baby. He was born in a manger. He was a bright and morning star. He grew up among the people and started preaching in the streets. He started performing miracles, but this upset some of the Jewish leaders. But, the Jewish le but Jesus did not care, for Jesus was on a mission. He was on assignment by God. God needed the world to consider a new source of life. Jesus became the source for a new covenant. God grew tired of asking, where are you? So God gave the world a reason to look for God. God gave a reason to reflect on what it means to receive mercy and grace. God gave the world a new source to consider. So when the time came for Jesus to complete his assignment, he, he was tried before a group of his peers. He was accused of blasphemy by the Jewish leaders. He insulted them and when he by when he claimed to be the son of God. So on this Sunday, and on that Friday, when they took Mary's baby, the carpenter's son, they marched Jesus up the hill of Calvary with a cross on his back. They laid him upon some carpenter's wood. First, they nailed his hands. Next, they nailed his feet. They placed a crown of thorns on his head. They hung him up on the cross. They raised him high for the world to see. They pierced him in his side. Blood and water came out of his body before he died. And just when they thought they had killed him, God came into the garden of Calvary and said to my son, where are you? And Jesus said, into my, to thy hands I commend my spirit. And those who eaten, had eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thought they had won, but they didn't consider the source. They crucified Jesus, but they didn't consider the source. They laid him in the tomb, but they didn't consider the source. The angels rolled the stone away, but they didn't consider the source. They found his tomb was empty, but they didn't consider the source. Jesus had gone to hell and the grave, but they didn't consider the source. But Jesus went to get to the keys of the kingdom, and they didn't consider the source. And so on the third day, he got up with all powers in his hands. The tree of life got up that we might be saved because they didn't consider the source. So whatever you are going through, look for God. Don't have God looking for you. Let Jesus be the source and the strength of your life. So the next time God asks, where are you? Let God know that you are in the hands of Jesus. May God add a blessing to the hearing of his word.